I am a teacher. This teaching over the last six weeks has inspired me to teach a unit on suffering and compassion. Oh, you've come for six weeks already? Well, wow, that's good. Is it possible to have you or someone come to my classroom one day and discuss these topics? Of course. So, if you, if you feel that we can come to talk about this. Sure, we are, we are we're happy to come to talk about it. And, um, but you have to tell us that what grade the students uh, are in what grade. Because talking to different grades, you have to use different uh, communication, of, 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 a different level of communication. Talking to a grade one, grade two, grade three, you cannot use high level words, especially in the, ter the terminology of Buddhism is so abundant, they may get lost in the ocean of terminology. However, we're talking to a higher level that we can, we, we can use some of the terminology. So it depends, number one depends on, we have to know what grades, grade one to grade 12. If you have a unit that you would like to talk on suffering and compassion, I think it's a very, it's a great idea because every being has to learn something about suffering. When a being learns suffering, he would not be always looking for unending pleasures in the satisfaction of senses. Uh, what I mean is, you have to know that life is not just looking for pleasures to satisfy your senses. Life is to realize, in spite of sometimes happiness, you have to realize the sufferings around you or in you and have to face up to it. Not just realize, you have to face up to every one of this suffering. Say for example, if a teenager knows how to face, to confront the suffering, he will not commit suicide. He will not take to drugs. Uh, say, a teenager, um, his mom and dad is having a divorce. They don't want them to be separated. And uh, that's the reason why he's always in agony. But then, he does not know why. He may blame the dad or blame the mom. He does not know what, what arises from this, that the suffering inside of him mentally. He does not know. He's just blamed for what is going to him. So he's just taking a negative approach in realizing the suffering. But however, if he can, be, if he can realize the suffering and to a certain way identify the causes of suffering, you help him to think. Why did my mom and dad now get into so bad conditions that they want a divorce? Look, my dad is always drinking, my mom uh, my mom always have to go out to work and make a living and my, my mom is not too happy and all that and all that. So he would be able to analyze the causes that lead to the suffering. And in the process of analyzing the causes, he would not commit the same thing again. But if he does not know the causes to it, he must just blame the society or blame the family, blame everything, everybody other than himself for receiving that kind of suffering. I'm just, 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 just giving one example. So there's so much in suffering. And I haven't read anything or heard anything as abundant as the Buddha's teaching in the identification of suffering. The Buddha identified the causes in suffering, the kinds of suffering. Identify causes of suffering, not just of the the present situation, not just of the lifetime's causes, it refers back to previous lifetime causes too. 
So the time horizon of a sovereign is three-dimensional. The past, the present, and the future. Not just analyzing the present suffering. And some suffering cannot be explained just in the present time perspective, you know. What happened to a baby born with a certain sickness? Why am I? I'm, I'm, I'm a teenager and why do I have to suffer from... Uh, I'm a stutterer. I, I, I cannot talk properly. Um, why do I have to suffer this? I was born that way. And why, why God is so, so unfair to me? <laughs> it's not God. It's not that God is unfair. God should be fair, right? How can, if God is unfair, God is not God. Then you shouldn't be believing in God. It's not God. It's you created your own destiny. You could have done something that caused you to have what you have today. There's so many information in recognizing suffering, understanding suffering, and what is most important, how to face up to it. And what is even more important, how to help others to face up to it. And in the process of helping others, you're realizing more recognition. You're realizing, you're learning more and more in the process of learning, of teaching others to do it. So there's so much to talk about suffering. Fortunately, in these days, Google has everything. You just put in suffering and you've got all the information in there. Particularly, you say, the Buddhist teaching on suffering. It's so abundant. That unit of suffering and compassion can go in for hours. And of course, you have to, in, it depends on what grade you're teaching, you have to introduce the interesting aspects in suffering by giving examples, practical examples at home, practical ex examples at school. There's suffering at school too. What kind of suffering at school? Right in the class, there is suffering. That is more immediate. Why do you suffer? Uh, at class, in the school. Suffering in the school. And, uh, and compassion. How about compassion? We start compassion in the class. You'll be more compassionate to your fellow students. Um, how? How to render your compassion? How not to hate each other? How to use compassion to improve the productivity in the classroom. You know, we, we, in the classroom, we still can talk about productivity. It's not just on a profit and capitalistic perspective of productivity. The productivity of the teacher, of the students. The productivity at class. Utilize time productively. How do we use materials productively? How do we not to vandalize your, st your student desk? and write graffitis on washrooms, war. So many things to talk about. We can talk about all these. Suffering and compassion, this is a very good topic. Because they, are, they, they seem to be opposites of each other. Actually, they go on hand in hand. There is no suffering without compassion. There is no compassion without suffering. Something like that. So that's the reason why the Buddha said, thank you, beings, because of you I get enlightened. Another way of saying it is, thank you, students, it's because of you that I become a better teacher. Without you, I cannot be a good teacher. Without you, I don't have a chance to teach. If the teacher appreciates every class, every talk in such a way that what I'm giving out is, I already have received a lot. Without you, students, I cannot be a good teacher. If you think that way, I, I still remember that movie many, many years ago. When I, when I was a teenager, I watched that movie. And I still remember it. It's by Sidney Poitier, as To Serve With Love. Have you ever seen that movie? You ever seen that movie? That's an extremely good movie. And uh, To Serve With Love. And they even have a song in it. I think every teacher should see that movie. And there's another movie. Oh, I shouldn't talk about movies all the time. Otherwise, they say, this monk is always watching movies. <laughs> I watched those movies when I was very young, OK? A bouquet for Charlie. Have you ever seen that movie? Charlie was a restaurant waiter. 
and he fell in love with a waitress. Um, but he had this kind of sickness that he knew that he could only um, live with a normal mind for about nine months. But he loved this lady so much that he fell in love. And he told his lady that after nine months, I will be like out of my mind. He, will, he couldn't remember anything. He, will be, he, he couldn't continue to love anymore. And the story developed uh, uh, expressing the meaning of unconditional compassion. A very simple movie, a very simple story, but it's so touching. Yes? Person may want to speak to the principal yeah. first, you know, and uh, because the school board has a protocol. Sometimes oh. the school board, uh, you know, as well. When you mentioned that a monk would be going to a school, they would say, oh, you are using religious influence on the students. But I think what you have to, to tell the principal is, uh, this monk has nothing to, it's not talking religion. When he talks, he's never talk about believing in the Buddha. He may not use that term too. He may say, walk in the last room and say, throw away Buddha. Or, don't think that I'm a monk. They just say I'm an average person. Uh, the Dalai Lama uh, was in town recently, and I went to see one of his sessions. And uh, when I was teaching, actually, Vancouver School Board implements his uh, compassion program. It was funded by Gobi Hawn, the actress. Yeah. And one, uh, she funded one elementary and one high school yeah. teaching compassion to the class. And I visited the elementary school class, and um, I spoke to the teacher there. Um, it's an East Side school, and that class was very tough. Lots of kids, you know, misbehaved uh, children. Mm. And uh, she had to send some of them uh, three or four times during the day to the principal's office. But after teaching the class, you know, compassion, mm. she yeah. no longer needed to send anybody to the principal's office. And they were all working hard. Yeah, and, that's uh, great. Yeah. yeah, that's good. So there's results in that. Yeah. And maybe that should, that should be documented, yes? Yeah. It was my question. Oh, it was your question? It was your question? Oh. Because I run a social development program for uh, kids in need to suffer with addiction, some of them. So I will talk to my principal and First of all, we have to, uh, we have to respect the protocol of, of, of the school board, but we have to convince the school board that what we are talking about, at least we, we I, I, can't, I can't represent all the other monks. What we will be talking about has nothing to do with religion. It's regarding how to be a better person. Uh, not say, oh, believe in the Buddha and come to my temple and prostrate and say your prayers, nothing like that. Maybe you document the results, introducing uh, that course, um, and document it and not let other teachers know about it. Most of the major religions talk about compassion too. But it would be surprising if the school board allowed you to talk about suffering. Because it, seems, it, it sounds negative, but it's not negative. Suffering is negative, but you can positively face it. You can positively resolve it. So, um, yeah. Someone to come to our clinic yeah. to start meditation class for our patient. Because oh. some patient asked me to, to start for meditation class. The meditation, oh yes, well, why not? You start, you can, you've been here for a number of years. You have been here for at least five years, I think, right? About five years? Eight years. Six years? Eight so years. eight years? Oh, you can start your meditation. <laughs> you, <laughs> you, know, you can, with, with what you know, you can start your meditation. Um, but make sure that, uh, this is just my, uh, my, um, my comment, in any meditation you start, don't talk about money. Don't talk about you register and you pay how much. Don't, don't talk about that because that, that makes meditation at a lower level. We never talk about that, okay? So it's good that you can, you can teach meditation what you know. You teach them what you know. Yeah, so that's the reason why we say meditation is a geometric expansion. We, you, are, you are learning it in here, you're practicing it in here, and if you geometrically expand it, it's good for everybody. Yeah, all right, yes? Uh, one time I taught my grade three class meditation because I asked them how many people cannot sleep at night, and most of them put up their hands. I, they, was, I was surprised. They cannot sleep at night, they'd have insomnia at night. Yes, yeah. that's right. Meditation at class? Meditation, yeah. 
Yeah, okay, that's fine. So, so they, they don't have to cross legs, they just sit on, on their chair and they meditate? Some of them lie down on the carpet, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, that's good. Teach them meditation and tell them the importance of the mind. And uh, uh, for those students who do not have confidence, many students have a confident problem. They always think that they're inferior, they're not as good, of the, uh, or they, they are not achieving as much as they want. Uh, they, they don't recognize their own values. You have to, to, to tell the students to have to recognize the values. Uh, why people commit suicide, why people can't do as, as, as good as others because some are confident in themselves and some are losing confidence day after day. And if they, are, if, if they also have to encounter problems at home, that would further aggra aggravate their, 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 their problem. Remember back there, we say Prajnaparamita, one of it is Viraya. Viraya is talking about confidence, how to increase your confidence in achieving what you want. Uh, See, um, so that's important too. Yeah. Next question. When entering that next body at rebirth, is there any fight going on with other energies that want to eat in earlier the same, the same body? Well, you're talking about two spirits entering a body? It's not like that. Reincarnation is not. This reincarnation is not a body there, and you want to enter that body. Body suggests it's a material. When a person dies, uh, within 49 days, he may be still roaming around, and that's what we call bado stage. Uh, that stage is body. the bado stage. Is not a body. It's not a material. It's like an energy. I can use the word energy. Sometimes the word energy is not even appropriate for it, but it, it assuming it's energy. So that bado stage of you is roaming around, uh, and the feeling of that bado stage, some of them may, do not want to leave. They want, they're still wandering around, and they wander around their families. They don't want to leave. They're reluctant to, to leave, and sometimes they're sad. Uh, they want to want to leave, and some, they are not like that. They know I'm dead already. So they, so they are more free. They don't attach, no more attachment as far as the bar, their own body. Their own body is concerned. And, they, and somehow they free themselves and they reincarnate according to their own karma to where they should go. So if a roaming bottle stage energy, uh, roaming around, there's a man and a woman making love and it sparkles certain light, uh, and that bottle stage person see the light because a bottle stage person is in a gloomy situation. They're quite dark. When you see the light, he will go into the light and when he reached the light, he already entered into that light. And why did he enter into that light? There's so many causes for it. Maybe they know the husband and wife, they know the men and the ladies, they know. And there are many, many reasons for it. It dates back to, re to previous lives. And then he entered that consciousness, energy, enters that body. When an ovum and a sperm fuse, then at the same time that energy zoom into it, the energy and this material of fusion would boom, form an embryo, form the seed in there. It is formed at the same time. When that is formed in there, that is him already, that is that energy already in that stage, in that body, such that in your body, you have you, your, your, your spiritual and your body. When you, when you, you already, already occupy that, and you're slowly growing and growing and growing, you're already there. But there are situations like, it enters the body, and somehow, because of other causes that we, can, we don't identify, it, it does not want to be there, or somehow that is, and another energy that could be simultaneously enter that body too. Because that light, that sparkle, attracts not only that bottle stage person, it could be attracting other bottle stage person, which is related to this man and woman too, not just you. Because, because everybody is so related to many, many parties, many, many people. So maybe at the same time, it depends on who is faster, who is more mature in the relationship and enter that body. So there shouldn't be any conflict. If 
the probability of that conflict is very, very slim. If there's such a probability, then maybe there's a twin. Unless that bottle stage in that state of embryo is destined to, because you, when you are in the, in the mom's body, you suffer as if you are a prisoner. You can't move. And that is a kind of suffering too. When certain bottle stage, because of causes that, that are unknown, they always have to go through that kind of suffering. In other words, they get into a, a human body, stay there for a month, they enter into another body, stay for a month, and they continue all the time suffering from the imprisonment of an embryo from life after life after life because of certain conditions, right? And in that situation, when he suffers one month and is doomed to die, a premature baby, then he leaves the body. And then another body will come into that mature body to form another body. That's possible. There's so many possibilities. And uh, is there any fight going on? I don't think there's a fight going on. It's, it depends on the maturity. There's no fight going on. You cannot just fight something to get in. Uh, I don't think there's any. It, it's all karma. Maybe the fight is, if the, depends on the, the, the maturity of the karma. And you call it a fight. Some is, is more mature than the other, and the, the, that, that mature one would get in more, faster. And you call that a fight. But, but that's just a word. I mean, a fight is not a proper description for, for such a situation. Final question. Can one attain Buddhahood or Nirvana without having Prajna Paramita? You cannot attain a Buddhahood if you are unenlightened, if you still have imperfections, if you still have mental afflictions, jealousy, hatred, ignorance, you have all that kind of thing, you cannot enter into Buddhahood. Um, so you must get rid of all those things. In, in other words, when you have impurities, you cannot call yourself pure. You have impurities. And you have to be free of all this. You have to learn how to get rid of all these. So when you ask me, do we have to get rid of these impurities? Yes. If you don't get rid of these impurities, how can you be a, a Buddhahood? So Prasna Paramita is not a holy grail. It's you have to get rid of all your problems before you become a Buddhahood. Okay? Next question. Last time it was mentioned by you that Nirvana is not a physical place, location but the Western Pure Land is. So where is the Western Pure Land, physical location, with respect to the planet Earth? Buddha Sahib community introduced the Western Pure Land to us, and he his, his said it's to the west of us as a location. Uh, Nirvana is not a location. Whatever is still a location is illusory. It's just like um, um, a caravan of people they haven't reached to oasis yet. They have come to a city when they take a break, where they have water and all that. You could just go under there before you starve yourself to death. You go onto that city. That city amidst a mirage. It's, it's, not, it's not real, but there's still a city that you replenish all your food, your, your drink, and, and after you rest properly there, and then you go on your way to, to oasis, to that uh, Shangri-La. But you, you need some place as an intermediate place before you go there. And that Western Pure Land was the Amitabha's Pure Land where he constructed that university to teach you to go to Nirvana. But that place is just a created place. And after you've gone there, then you learn, and you learn, you become the Buddha, you don't need that place anymore. It's just an intermediate place for you to learn. It's not a final destination. It's a physical location, but it's not a final Nirvana state. Well, it's to the west of the planet Earth, very, very far away to the west, where Amitabha constructed the land. And also, in order to go to that land, you need certain method to go there. You need to link up with that. You need to register. You need the qualifications to go there. But Amitabha reduced his qualifications quite low so that he would accept everybody. And his qualification is as long as at the juncture of death, you're not con so confused that your mental frequency is linked with his mental frequency. And he told you, now, my frequency is this. Now, here is the device. 
and this device would link up with my frequency. You have to keep this in good shape. You have to use this device properly in order that you can you are linked in there. And that device is always concentrate in chanting its name because most people are confused at the juncture of death. So you have to link your frequency with that frequency so that you zoom, you go over there. It's, sci it's scientific. 300 years ago, nobody would discover that certain station can receive human voice within thousands of miles away. But now, if a frequency matches, he can receive you and you can receive him. It's that frequency that matches. Without that frequency, you cannot match. But 3,300 years ago, 300 years ago, you won't imagine that you can use a frequency to link your, your communication with the central communication. It's out of your imagination. But it is now. It is now. So it's not unlikely that that frequency will link you up to that pure land. Very scientific. 